Our scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor, Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler over the region of Iteria and Triconius, and Licinius ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caphias, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into the, to all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophets Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Sometimes people wonder why we have some of this information about who the emperor was, who the governor was of Judea, and so on, in, in the Bible. Why, why do we think that that is necessary to have those things there? Well, to start with, the Bible was considered a historical document for a long time because it, it recorded events that took place. And it recorded individuals who partook in those events. And then the secular world began to record history as well. In fact, uh, there is a, a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus, and I actually have uh, a copy of one of his uh, books. And in that book, we can find information that we can verify the scripture with. You see, so you have the secular world recording some of the same events that are recorded in the Bible, and so now you have more information to help prove what the scriptures are saying to be true. Jesus is recorded in some of Josephus's writings, but not in the same manner that you see in the scriptures. So there's a cross-reference now that wouldn't have been there had one way or the other not been recorded. In fact, there's a lot of archaeological discoveries going on today in Israel, in the region, in that area, where they are looking for and discovering some of the communities that have been mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament. They are finding these artifacts that prove that there was such a place. Have you ever watched any of those documentaries about those kind of discoveries? Some of that stuff is, is just amazing. And when you look at it, and you, you look at how many times a city has been built in the same place, and they dig down, and they dig down, and they dig down. Oh, well, look here, you know. And sometimes those discoveries come purely by accident. Well, we're going to build a nice, firm foundation for this building, and then all of a sudden, oh, they get down there and they find, well, there's, there's another civilization that lived on this spot. And then they begin the research and, and discovering more and more things about what took place in that particular region. <clears throat> Here... In Luke chapter 3, we are verifying what was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. 
And now if you don't know about the prophet Isaiah, the book of Isaiah spans a very long period of time. It, impossible that one man wrote all of Isaiah. They say there's at least three different authors who were involved in writing the book of Isaiah. So we don't really know for sure which one wrote <clears throat> each of the various things. But here we have information that says there's coming a, a, a man and he's going to come and he's going to be delivering a message to Israel. And I'm going to put it in today's language. Y'all need to get your act together. Because the Lord is coming. So when we think about his second coming, it still applies. Y'all, we all need to get our act together because he's coming. Make the, the path straight. Smooth out the rough edges. Everybody is going to see that God's salvation is real. And it's there. In Micah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, he says, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare a way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner, a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. There are those messages all throughout the scripture. They are there to testify to the goodness of God and to the promise that God keeps his promises and Jesus was one of those promises that he's kept and now through Jesus he has made many many additional promises things that are going to happen and for us to be prepared for them John the Baptist John, introducing people to baptism in a way that they hadn't never met it before. Baptize yourselves. Be baptized and be forgiven. Forgiveness for them had always come at the hand of an animal, the end of a, a knife. And it was their blood that cleansed them from their sin, just like the doorposts in Egypt. It was that blood that protected them. It was Jesus' blood that delivered us and continues to deliver us. There are Many ways for us to, to live out our life in a way that is pleasing to God. Now sometimes it doesn't look too much like it on the surface. Sometimes it's, it can be difficult for us to understand. I have an illustration here that maybe, <clears throat> maybe you can see somebody in your life that might fit this particular individual. And God wants us to see others in a different light than just the judgmental light that we have a tendency to, to, to look at others with. This came from a writer who wrote a novel that was titled uh, Refinery. And it, of course it was at the time was not, had not been published yet. Now, there's a story of an old pipe fitter whom everyone called Sarge, 
who lost his life in an unsuccessful attempt to prevent an industrial disaster which destroyed a large part of the oil refinery where he worked and killed a number of people. Sarge was a crusty old character, not noted for his piety, but his co-workers loved him with that special kind of love with which men love each other. Several hundred of them gathered at the graveside for his simple funeral. The local pastor, Tim, preached the following sermon. <clears throat> we have gathered here to celebrate the life of William L. Anderson, the one most of you called Sarge. The family told me that Sarge would want me to keep this short, so I will. But there are some things that just need to be said. A fellow asked me, what in the world are you going to be able to say at a funeral about old Sarge? I suspect some of you have been wondering about that. After all, he wasn't notorious for going to church, and I've heard rumors that Sarge drank a little beer, and that he sometimes cussed. A little ripple of laughter spread over the congregation, and the people began to relax a little bit. Tim went on, but in spite of all those things, you have loved Sarge. So it is hard to believe that God loves, is it hard to believe that God loves Sarge too? That's what counts right now. None of us is good enough to go to meet the Lord counting on our own goodness. We all have to go counting on God's love for us. Jesus came to show us how much God loves us. And Paul said in Romans 8 that nothing in the whole creation can separate us from the love of God. With that in mind, we can with confidence command our friend Sarge to the care of God. Well, someone might want to mention something about the judgment of God. And that's a good question because the Bible does talk about judgment. In fact, there's a passage about judgment that ought to ring a bell with lots of us because it talks about refining. And we know about oil, refining oil, but this passage compares the judgment of God to someone refining silver and gold. And I just read that in Micah. The difficulties that we face in life are like the refining fire that help to make us what we need to be. It is much the same as the sculptor's hammer and chisel as he removes small pieces of what he wants it to be. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to be a sculptor? We can go out west and we can go to Mount Rushmore and we can go to Crazy Horse Mountain and we can see some fantastic works of art at the hands of a magnificent sculptor. What is it that enables such a person to be able to take a piece of stone the side of a mountain and through their mind create such a magnificent thing? I challenge you today that you and I are mere pieces of clay that God is molding and sculpting and creating what God intends for us to be. And it is the same principle that God, as He's working with that piece of clay, sees exactly what He wants it to be before He gets there. He can see that He needs to remove this little bit here and this little bit there in order to create that magnificent appearance that is going to be in the end. It's when you'll never look at a piece of art like that again the same way maybe you have before. You see, God sees what He wants us to be. And it is you and I, my friends, 
that determined how hard he must use that hammer and chisel to remove those things that interfere with us being what he wants us to be. How far are we going to go? How much are we going to hold fast to those things that God wants to remove from our lives? And there's a mass of things that God could have a desire to remove from our lives, and sometimes they are unhealthy relationships. And sometimes there are things that he needs to apply to us that we can't see as being healthy for us. So, God is creating a magnificent sculptor, a sculpture of each of us. And we just need to let him do what he wants to do. Don't make him use dynamite to remove something like they do on those mountains. Just let him take his gentle hand and brush it aside. Because in the end, it's all about us being ready. Ready for that time when Jesus comes again. Let's pray. Gracious and mighty God, we thank you for your loving 